I know it sounds crazy, but did Pepsi have one of the largest militaries in the world at one point in time? Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck? <laughs> no, not like that. Let's go back a few years to 1898, 12 years after the invention of Coca-Cola, where Pepsi Cola was invented. This sugary brown drink was pretty much like its competitor, but without the Coke. This was the year when one of the most famous rivalries began and still persists to this day. Let me know down in the comments if you prefer Coca-Cola or Pepsi. <laughs> Just kidding. By the 1980s, Pepsi Cola was making loads of money and the popularity was skyrocketing. But what could they do with all that money? Once you find the perfect formula, there's not much else you can really do. Sure, you can make the process more efficient and start creating another flavors, for example, but after you've done that, you'll be sitting on top of a pile of cash year after year and the customers buy and consume your product. So what did Pepsi do? They started to go big on advertisements. I know it sounds obvious now, with examples like Coca-Cola and the Christmas advertisements or Red Bull and their radical image by being in Formula 1 and radical sports, but back then it was pretty innovative. This was the best way to expand the brand and make it as global as fast as possible. Once you dominate the market, then you expand sideways, with Pepsi now owning brands like Lay's, Doritos, Mountain Dew, etc. In fact, most food brands today are owned by massive groups, but let's not go there. It all started during the height of the Cold War when President Dwight Eisenhower and Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev came to an agreement. The USSR wanted to open trade with the US and the US wanted to promote capitalism in the USSR. So they agreed on a form of cultural exchange. Each will design an exhibition highlighting the achievements of their country and display them in each other's. The Soviet exhibition portrayed its achievements in areas in which were superior, namely in space. And it opened in New York City in June of 1959. America included examples from its own culture in which it was paving the way, such as with appliances of various sorts, kitchen models, electronics, and also soda. The American National Exhibition opened in Moscow in July of that same year and the United States sent Vice President Richard Nixon as his host. However, the Moscow-based event got off to a rather rocky start. Khrushchev was unimpressed with color TV. In fact, he was unimpressed with mostly everything on display, claiming that Russia would have the same technology itself in a matter of years. Further, he took advantage of the opportunity to fire some shots, commenting angrily on the US involvement in Eastern Europe. And, if that wasn't enough, he gave his opinion that Nixon only feared communism because he couldn't understand it. It was during this heated discussion that the Pepsi representative saw its opportunity. To cool things down, he gave Khrushchev a cool, refreshing drink. While the Soviet leader found the American exhibition lacking and the United States government intrusive and uninformed, he was amazed with the contents of this cup. And just like that, Pepsi Cola became the first capitalist product to be sold in the USSR. Pepsi's success following America's exhibition in Moscow was inarguably the greatest and longest lasting since the North Carolina beverage was offered the full monopoly and exclusivity to the Soviet market. Now, the arrangement to sell Pepsi in Russia was not made without a few bumps here and there. Though the Russians wanted permanent access to the drink, there was a significant problem with its payment. Russia's currency, the ruble, was not universally accepted and so they needed to make an alternative arrangement. I know this was before the internet, but it's quite fascinating that the two world powers had an exhibition to show off their culture, technology and ideas. Imagine the US and China doing something like that nowadays. I might do an in-depth video on what was shown in this exhibition, so make sure to subscribe. But anyways, back to the video. Right, 1980s. Capitalist America's economy is booming with companies being created left and right and innovation accelerating. But on the other side of the world, quite the opposite. In 1989, the Soviet Union was in a state of political and economic turmoil. 
the Cold War was coming to an end, and the government was facing increasing pressure to reform its repressive policies and inefficient system. The Soviet economy was also struggling, with high inflation and shortages of basic goods. The lack of freedom and the poor living conditions led to widespread discontent among the people. But that doesn't mean people didn't like sugary drinks. Far from it. The population from the Soviet Union were just as addicted to this brown nectar from the gods as the Americans themselves. The difference was, the government didn't have the money to pay for it. So what did they do? Well, they offered the most available and spendable resource they had. Not the oil or the natural gas much talked about today, or even minerals, but nothing less than war machines. Back in the days, the Soviet Union devoted between 15 and 17% of its annual GDP to military spending, and since the war was long over, they had a lot of military equipment to spare. The Soviets offered a cruiser, a frigate, a destroyer and 17 submarines in exchange for $3 billion worth of Pepsi. This historic deal made Pepsi the sixth largest military power in the world at the time. Kendall, the Pepsi representative, told the National Security Advisor of the US that they were disarming the USSR faster than their own government, which made the president really angry. But now the questions arise. Where is all of this military equipment? What did Pepsi do to its navy? Do they still have it? Well. With no eBay or Amazon at the time, Pepsi looked at other ways to sell their newfound military stock, eventually selling the entire fleet to a Swedish company for scrap recycling, since the metal used in the military is of a higher grading. That meant that their brief foray as a military force was finally over. Pepsi's success soon came to a screeching halt when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. Instead of dealing with one government-run body, there were now 15 countries to negotiate with. Coca-Cola took advantage of this and made an aggressive entry into the region. Pepsi did try several marketing efforts to hold their market share. The most famous of these including launching a giant Pepsi replica can to the Mir space station to film a commercial with Russian cosmonauts in 1996, an initiative that cost 7 figures. While Russia is still the largest market for Pepsi outside of the US, accounting for 8% of global sales, Pepsi has lost the number one spot in Russia to Coca-Cola. Despite the storied history, creative negotiations and brilliant publicity, it seems the Russians now prefer the taste of Coke. That, or maybe, because Coca-Cola represented change and Pepsi reminded them of the not-so-good old days. This was not even the last time Pepsi was involved with military equipment. In the mid-90s, Pepsi aired a series of commercials aiming to promote their products where the ultimate prize was none other than a military fighter jet. They even made a Netflix series about it. Pepsi's most recent marketing play was to buy 100 Tesla semis, making their fleet more sustainable but most importantly, getting on the front pages of the news showing us that the strategy still remains. Check out my video on the massive underground airbase built underneath a mountain by Yugoslavia that was capable of sustaining a direct hit from a nuclear bomb.